morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, several people over dinner last night asked if I was going to talk about Brexit. Um, if that's what you think, um, then either you should leave or I should leave. Um, my only thought about Brexit, um, I was reminded of by a poem by Philip Larkin, um, who said, ah, solving that question brings the priest and the doctor in their long coats running over the fields. And that's where we are, uh, a kind of madness has uh, entrapped our political class from which they seem incapable of escaping. But I was honored to be asked to speak at the FSI's 20th anniversary. It's done great work over the last two decades. I was, in fact, a regulator when it was born, so I was uh, involved in discussions surrounding it, and have admired the work done under its two chairmen, Josef uh, Tosovsky, of course, for a long time, and Fernando Restoy ever since. Sadly, there has been no shortage of financial stability issues to address. The financial stability industry uh, has expanded greatly in the last decade, as well as the Institute. There's, of course, a board. The IMF publishes a six-monthly uh, global financial stability report. Every self-respecting central bank publishes one, and some regulators, too. Now, I've never sought uh, to claim personal responsibility for this industry, um, but perhaps I can immodestly mention my part in it today because I am fairly certain that the first financial stability review to be published was the one I launched at the Bank of England in 1996. And that's it. Um, it's the financial stability review, as it was then called. And in a review of financial stability reports, Martin Chihak and others credit it as the first ever edition. And I looked back at it the other day, as so I still have one, and the first editorial was signed Prudence, which was a kind of in-joke, because Prudence uh, was the name of my wife. Uh, indeed, uh, as a matter of fact, it still is uh, the name <laughs> of my wife. And the bank's financial stability review was both successful and unsuccessful, because it has inspired a huge number of followers. There were over 50 of them by 2012, according to the CHIHAC uh, review. But at the time, our objective was to show that the bank was concerned about financial risks in order to protect its position. Because in 1996, we knew that there was a chance that an incoming Labour government would strip the Bank of England of responsibility for banking supervision. It hadn't, to be frank, covered itself with glory a year or so before in the bearings uh, debacle in Singapore. So we thought it a smart move to publish a new report in partnership with the Securities and Investments Board to show that we could, in the bank, do joined-up analysis of markets. In that sense, it was a total failure because the Labour government did move supervision out of the bank in 1997. Of course, it's since returned there, but that's another story. But enough uh, prehistory. That was 11 years BC, uh, before the crisis, uh, and now in AC12, uh, we are still trying to understand what happened and why. And as Fernando mentioned, I teach a course on the subject at Sciences Po in Paris. And it's interesting to get young people's reactions to this topic as well. The 10-year anniversary of the Lehman collapse last year stimulated an outpouring of reminiscence, analysis, and pet theorizing. Perhaps surprisingly, as time goes by, there is, if anything, less and less consensus on the causes and appropriate responses. But amidst this outpouring of commentary, I identify three strands of opinion. And at the risk of shocking this earnest, high-minded audience, I will characterize their views by reference to three popular songs. The first argument, which one hears from some bankers, a song one hears sung by bankers, owes a lot to the Pink Floyd song, The Wall, with its memorable refrain, hey teachers, uh, leave us kids alone. Um, we don't need no education. And the drift of this argument is that the banks, well, had a little shock. We've learnt our lesson, we've understood the importance of a bit more capital, and the regulators can now leave us alone, thank you very much. 
safe in the knowledge that we will not misbehave again. Now, there is some substance behind this argument. Certainly, it's true that banks' capital ratios have been greatly strengthened. Uh, in many cases, banks now, in fact, operate with four or five times the hardcore tier one capital they had at the onset of the crisis, and it's better quality capital too. I mean, RBS had about two and a half percent core tier one in 2007, and we now have 16 and a half percent. But I am not uh, in the Pink Floyd camp, I should be clear. Indeed, I was never much of a Pink Floyd fan, in fact. Uh, perhaps that is because RBS was one of the worst affected banks in the crisis. Indeed, some might argue that it was the worst affected. This slide shows that there were many ways of getting into trouble in the crisis, from operating with a very thin capital cushion through making unwise uh, acquisitions, having a risky funding structure, to simple bad lending. And RBS proudly managed a full house of problems. Uh, so we know that higher capital is not the answer to all of them. And I'm mindful of Badgett's observation that no amount of capital will rescue a bad bank. There is more to bank reform than higher core tier one ratios, and some of the cultural changes needed are far harder to implement. But nor am I in the group which camps at the other end of the spectrum, who regard the increase in capital so far implemented as hopelessly inadequate, a school represented by people like Anat Admati, Martin Wolf, and others. We might call this the too much is never enough school. Uh, in fact, the words of the Lauren Aldred song, Never Enough, are remarkably apposite. She sings, towers of gold are still too little. Their hands could hold the world, but it'll never be enough. Now, not all bank capital is held in the form of uh, gold, of course, but let that pass. But according to that theory, we should be operating with far, far higher levels uh, of capital, perhaps 25% core tier one. Um, but whatever level you're at, it's always got to be more. I am not persuaded that it would make sense to impose further significant increases in required capital for banks. The Basel Committee's own analysis suggests that the additional insurance protection bought against potential defaults would come at a high price. Severe stress tests in several jurisdictions show that banks could now survive adverse scenarios which Mark Carney has described as biblical. He asserted recently that banks in most regions are now more likely to be stabilizers than amplifiers of shocks. But there is one aspect of the argument that should give us pause, because it's true that investors have not yet been fully persuaded that banks are good homes for their money. The price to book ratios of most international banks have remained stubbornly low. Larry Summers has argued that the franchise value of banks has declined. And my own view is that the decline has more to do with a changed competitive environment in which new firms with better and cheaper technology are competing business away from traditional banks. Profitability has declined, and that, combined with very low interest rates for a long time, explains much investor reluctance to invest in the banking sector. A third strand of argument with which I have more sympathy is sometimes described as the whack-a-mole uh, theorem. And indeed, we heard an interesting version of whack-a-mole before dinner last night, uh, put in a much more uh, serious and analytical way than I am doing. But pursuing my popular song theme, I prefer to call it the close the door, they're coming through the window uh, argument, uh, a song from the 50s that some of you may be old enough to remember by the stargazers. In other words, by clamping down on banks, forcing them to hold more capital, and reducing their ability to supply credit and take risks, regulators have pushed credit creation into the shadows, or to what the Financial Stability Board now say, we should call the NBFI sector. They have now deemed shadow banking to be an inappropriate term, as I understand it. Non-bank financial intermediation has expanded greatly in recent years, and we heard some examples of it in the US. The total balance sheet size of the universe monitored by the FSB has gone up by 9% a year in the last five years and is now over $116 trillion, or 30% of all financial assets. Most of that expansion has occurred in Europe, 
and in North America, which account for 60% of the total. In terms of the types of institution involved, the FSB described the fastest growing subsector unhelpfully as other investment funds. And these are funds which are not classified as hedge funds or money market funds. Now, the FSB does a very thorough job of aggregating the data and monitoring the interconnectedness of NBFIs and banks. It says these connections are growing and that the scale of NBFI means we must certainly monitor its development and maybe, probably, sometimes, occasionally worry about it. Quite where that exercise in worrying might lead us is less clear. And it's less clear what remedies regulators have in mind to address this very large expansion. The regulatory environments in which these other institutions operate differ from place to place, and the powers regulators have to monitor them and intervene in their affairs vary greatly. And from the perspective of the banking sector, we do not see much sign of a level playing field being uh, developed in this area. There are some elements of the growth of non-bank credit which have been attracting more attention recently. That's particularly true of leverage loans. In a speech in London uh, a month ago, Mark Carney drew attention to a worrying development. He pointed out that relative to earnings, aggregate corporate debt in the US and UK is nearing its pre-crisis peak and the distribution is worsening. In the UK, the share of highly leveraged companies is above pre-crisis levels, and this is despite the very modest growth in investment. One oft-quoted measure is the triple B-rated bonds are now about half the market compared to just a quarter in 2007. Mark Carney points out that these trends are accelerating. The ratio of debt to EBITDA has risen remarkably in the last year. Where are these risky obligations held? Well, that also differs from place to place. In the US, banks and insurers own around a third of CLOs, usually the less risky tranches, compared to only 6% for EU27 firms and 2% for UK firms. For the most part, they're held by funds who can afford to lose money, so do not pose systemic risk in the way sub bank subprime holdings did. But a bursting of that bubble would be troublesome nonetheless. And a McKinsey analysis shows that overall market-funded corporate debt has risen sharply in recent years. Now, we should welcome the diversification of funding for corporates, which spreads risk around the system and enhances resilience, but the scale of indebtedness is striking. And of course, the tax treatment of debt over equity encourages that growth. On this subject, the CLA market, I was pleased to read just last week that Randy Quarles has announced an FSB review of this part of the market, and as banks, I think we should certainly welcome that. Of the other things that we are deemed to worry about, one of them, of course, is the growth of debt in China, which has figured prominently in recent IMF reports. But in that case, I think the growth rate has fallen back recently and from my own work in China as an advisor to both the CBIRC, as it now is, and the CSRC, it strikes me that a lot of the Chinese debt is debt being moved from one sector to another. And overall, the Chinese public sector has debt capacity and overall also has the instruments it can use to deal with this problem. So Chinese debt is not, in fact, high on my worry list. Public debt globally, however, does remain elevated post-crisis. Now, modern monetary theorists would have us view that as benign or even positive. Having lived through UK public expenditure crises in the 1970s, when I was in the Treasury and buyer strikes in the gilt market, I am conditioned to regard high public debt as a problem that has to be dealt with one day. So my whack-a-mole worry list includes leveraged corporate debt and overall public sector debt, and particularly the evolving political attitudes to that public sector debt. I also worry about the impact on the financial system and on financial stability of a number of new developments which cannot be regarded as crisis-related. Among them, I include uh, cyber risk, um, uh, the impact of fintech, on 
the viability of traditional banks, and particularly the impact of big tech entrance uh, in the banking system. The FSB last month published a very interesting report on the potential impact of large technology companies like Amazon, Google, Alibaba, and Ant Financial, with their huge financial resources and ability to cross-subsidize on the business of banking. One possible interpretation of the low rating of many large banks, as I've mentioned, is that investors fear they may lose the more profitable parts of their business to these new competitors, leaving them running the financial infrastructure for which they find it hard to charge adequately. The FSB worry that in these circumstances, the banks may seek out more risky business to compensate for the loss of their past core profit sources. Now, I hope we will be, as bankers, wise enough to not to yield to that temptation, but I understand the point. My concern is more that the business models of banks are threatened. So my conclusion from a necessarily brief review of the state of overall financial markets is the banking system is far stronger, but that debt levels remain worryingly high. And as Adair Turner and others have pointed out, a given rate of GDP growth now seems to require a larger increase in debt. He links that to the growth in income and wealth inequality as richer deciles spend a lower portion of their income. Growing inequality of wealth in particular, and income inequality has flattened or declined in some countries recently, is also part of a worrying growth in the share of votes going to populist parties, in Europe in particular, and the associated growth in interest in policy proposals which have largely been off the agenda for several decades. I'm thinking most obviously of protectionism and trade tariffs, but there are others. There has, for example, been an evident backlash against central bank independence in several countries, and I'll say more about that in a moment. We can see the aggregate impact of these trends in the growth of uncertainty about economic policy. Baker, Bloom, and Davis have developed an index of economic policy uncertainty, which is currently at a record high. And that is not surprising and suggests that the most concerning risk, and it certainly is the risk that concerns me as the chairman of a large bank, is the scope for damaging policy errors. We have moved a long way from the mood in 2008-9 when successive G20 summits agreed a substantial reform program and implemented it with enthusiasm, using the FSB as their delivery mechanism. <clears throat> One has to question whether there is the same degree of mutual trust and shared interest today. It's therefore, in my view, regrettable that the opportunity to give the FSB a formal legal status underpinned by an international treaty was not taken in 2012 when it was under active consideration. <clears throat> At the time, the flexibility allowed by the FSB's informal status was seen as an advantage. That is much less clear to me today. There's been political pressure on the Fed to withdraw from it and other international bodies so far resisted. Um, but that resistance would be easier and stronger with the US and other countries to be signatories to a treaty on international financial cooperation. My co-author Maria Zhivitskaya and I have written about the limitations of voluntarism in a chapter in a forthcoming Oxford University handbook on global economic governance. Unfortunately, like these academic publications, I could have said that, I think, three years ago when we wrote it. Uh, it's still forthcoming, but we are told that it's about to be published uh, in the next month or two. And those limitations are greater when countries lack confidence in each other's regulation. Andy Haldane at the Bank of England wrote persuasively a couple of years ago about the need to manage global finance as a system. He argued that financial globalization has created larger than ever opportunities, but also greater than ever threats. We should therefore, he argued, turn the current non-system, replete with informal bodies of uncertain membership and vague powers, into one with an identifiable architecture. Developments in the five years since he wrote that paper have only strengthened those arguments. Haldane was then mainly discussing the provision of financial support and the possible creation of an international lender of last resort. Barry Eichengreen goes further and has argued for a world financial organization with the power to sanction members whose national regulatory policies are not up to international standards. Personally, I think it unfortunate that these radical ideas were not taken forward at a time when there could have been the political will to do so. 
Now we are very far from that situation. So it would be idle to advance these forward-looking proposals today. Realistically, we should be trying to preserve the elements of international consensus and cooperation we have and try to protect against other potential damaging policy errors. These are the biggest worries, in my view, that we face today. They may not be the fractures which created the last crisis, but they could produce a new one. Now, I have little to say about the first and probably the most worrying area, tariff wars. It's not an area of competitive advantage for me. The most recent signs in the US-China relationship are a little bit more optimistic, but tensions remain high. Second area of concern is, of course, much closer to home. Almost three years on for our referendum, the shape of the future relationship between the UK and the 27 remains wholly unclear. And even after a withdrawal agreement is concluded, if it is, that will still be the case, as the political declaration which accompanies it is vague and aspirational. Financial services, and financial stability indeed, have not been as prominent in the painful debates surrounding Brexit as they might have been. Our government has prioritised other areas of the economy. They have spent a lot more time on fish than on finance, rather bizarrely given the relative weights in the British economy. So it's hard to know what new arrangements will emerge to manage the complex interactions between London's markets and the rest of Europe. The Bank of England assessed the risk of a major disruption to financial stability of even a disorderly Brexit as relatively low, but they warned that in the longer term, without deep and comprehensive cooperation between the UK and the 27, there is a risk that we turn inwards towards closed markets, which, and I quote, would in turn restrict cross-border investment, fragment pools of funding and liquidity, and reduce competition. The result would be higher financing costs for households and businesses, less reliable access to finance, and less resilient finance. One academic study of Brexit and financial stability by Samitas and others argues the consequences would be more severe uh, for the EU27 than for the UK. That would only be, can only be a speculative conclusion, but it's clear that the ambition to develop a fully-fledged capital markets union in Europe has suffered a setback as a result of a popular vote in which the merits of open capital markets did not figure largely in the debate and where the campaign revealed that arguments based on those assumptions, widely shared in the financial community and among economists, had no resonance with the people whatsoever. Warnings by the central bank and others were characterized as project fear designed to distort the democratic will. More recently, when Governor Carney produced some carefully worded comments and warning against a disorderly Brexit, the chef de file of the hard Brexiteers, Jacob Rees-Mogg, characterized him as a, quote, second-tier Canadian politician and dismissed his arguments uh, out of hand. Uh, this is what those of you who are football fans know as playing the man, not the ball. Um, in the not-too-distant past, a senior spokesman of whichever party would not have criticized a central banker in that way. He or she would have had more respect for the bank's independence and recognized that ad hominem attacks could damage the credibility of the institution from which we would all suffer. But it's evident that the reverence for central bank independence has much diminished recently, and not only in the UK. President Trump has described the Fed as loco in India, the RBI governor was summarily removed, Mario Draghi is not exactly the favorite son of the new Italian government. The growth of populist parties with little commitment to independent uh, institutions especially where unemployment's remained high, has created a different mood. A few years ago, we seemed in this area to have reached a kind of end of history moment in which a Basel consensus, to coin a phrase, governed economic policy making. Country after country converged on a model in which an independent central bank was charged with meeting an inflation target, which could be any number you like, as long as it was two, Fiscal policy was a completely separate matter, generally organized around the principle of a budget balance through the cycle. But history has restarted, as it often tiresomely does. On the fiscal side, we have modern monetary theorists arguing that fiscal deficits don't matter. Other more mainstream critics argue persuasively for more overt policy coordination. Bill White, well known in this jurisdiction, has pointed out that in recent years, the monetary policy drivers have had their feet firmly on the accelerator, while the regulators have been pressing hard on the brake. Does that make sense, he asks. And plenty of voices can be heard arguing that central bank independence has had its day, 
and that the masters of the universe in Basel should be cut down to size. A recent poll of 70 economists organized by the Center for European Policy Research showed that this rethinking has not extended to the economics profession. Almost all of them agreed that central bank independence was very important in the future. But when asked if they thought it could be sustained, their answers were very different. Almost a third think that it will not be possible to sustain the model we've operated in the last few years into the future, and that central bank independence in Europe will decline. Why has the current of opinion turned? Well, there's no single answer to that. Listening to the critics, one hears a wide variety of arguments, some focused on supposed policy errors made by the central bank since the crisis. Others raise various forms of conspiracy theories with central bankers conspiring to thwart the popular will in the interests of their banking friends. A version of that maintains that there has been political capture of central bank boards. A more persuasive set of arguments focuses on the unconventional policies implemented over the recent decade. QE is a cousin of fiscal policy. Shouldn't different forms of accountability and political control attach to it? In fact, that is the case in the UK where the Treasury sets the quantum, leaving timing and method to the bank. Then there is the argument that QE has had a distributional impact benefiting wealthier holders of financial assets. Central banks argue strongly that the total impact of QE has not increased inequality. But I have to say that those arguments have not cut through the public debate. There are critics, too, of the central bank role in macroprudential policy, which often focuses on particularly sensitive sectors like the housing market. Stan Fisher has discussed the implications of that for independence. The Fed is not fully independent in that area, while the Bank of England and the ECB broadly are. One of the more thoughtful reflections on the change has come from Paul Tucker, former deputy governor of the Bank of England, in his book, Unelected Power which is a very careful analysis leading to some interesting suggestions for more robust accountability surrounding the central bank. In an interview about it, he said, the more power that you have that you don't really need, the more the political world will lean on you to influence the way you exercise your powers. This is a persuasive argument. I would in fact take it further than Tucker does. It's very striking that the great winners from the global financial crisis in terms of power and status have been the central banks in spite of the questions raised about their performance in the early years of the century. The Fed has gained responsibilities. The ECB now supervises 85% of the European banking system, while the Bank of England is responsible for monetary policy, quantitative easing, macroprudential policy, banking supervision, and insurance supervision, a remarkable accretion of functions. As Tucker points out, such an accumulation of power creates the risk of a backlash. Now, I might be thought to have an ax to grind here, as the first chairman of the Financial Services Authority since dismembered. Perhaps I do, but my principal concern is that we should protect the core of central bank independence for monetary policy, which has brought many economic benefits. And if adding non-essential functions threatens that independence, it may come at a high price. Certainly, if one is to do so, the accountability framework needs to be robust, as Tucker argues. That is harder in the case of the ECB unless the treaty's changed than it has been in the case of the Bank of England. So to return finally to the examination question posed for me this morning, I would answer that many of the problems revealed in the banking system and in traded markets have been addressed. Solved is a dangerous word to use because the solutions have created new incentives for non-bank finance and the catchily named NBFI sector needs to be carefully watched. Furthermore, the broader question of the system architecture of global finance has been ducked. We still rely on a non-system, in Haldane's phrase, and seem condemned to do so. The generally good relations between central banks internationally provide some comfort, but the political pressures on those actors have grown, and their legitimacy is questioned. I applaud the efforts made by some central banks to engage more effectively with citizens in recent years, but the political climate in which they operate remains challenging. As one of the leaders of the UK's pro-Brexit campaign memorably said, people in this country have had enough of experts. If we do move into the age of amateur populist central bankers and supervisors, there will soon be many new fractures in the international financial system, and they will not be so hidden. So in conclusion, this banker's worries today 
and more in the political world than in the financial markets. Thank you.